Well, there we go. Here we go. All right, let's let's uh, welcome everybody aboard. Go ahead and admit. Admit all. Hey, welcome everybody. Good evening. Welcome back to Third Thursday. It's our live educational series produced by the uh, MRA Education Committee. Uh, I'm Charlie Shemansky. I was elected to serve as the MRA Education Committee Chair uh, several years ago. I want to kick off tonight with a special privilege by telling you um, how sweet it's been to serve the MRA as its Education Director for nearly the past decade. Uh, in that amount of time, we launched the online learning management systems, which now has more than 10,000 students worldwide over, I want to say, seven years. Uh, we never imagined such great numbers in a certificate-based online learning system. We've also partnered with MountainSafety.info, uh, the Avalanche and Avalanche Rescue Knowledge Base, and you MRA members can go to the MRA website and subscribe to that yourself at no cost because of the MRA's uh, partnership with that. We're grateful to Heiko Stopsack with King County Sheriff's Air Support Unit in Washington for leading that program. We have successfully developed uh, and put online three different videos from MRA spring meetings. The most recent is now up on the MRA YouTube site. It just got posted up there from our helicopter event in Flagstaff. Uh, hoping you'll take a look at that. And we're looking forward to doing a video again this year uh, in Salt Lake with uh, the uh, MRA spring meeting hosted by Salt Lake County SAR. Um, and of course, we launched Third Thursday. Welcome to Third Thursday. This was Mike St. John's uh, idea, brilliant idea. We launched uh, when COVID first happened. And uh, Mike with uh, Marin County SAR, developed this initially for all of us during COVID when in fact kind of we were not training together nearly as often and uh, but you know to our surprise people asked for third Thursday to continue even after the term social distancing was no longer in our vocabulary and um, and we're proud to keep it going uh, with all of those accomplishments complete uh, I announced at the 2023 spring business meeting in Flagstaff uh, that I would be stepping down as your MRA education director. Um, and tonight, I'm super excited to tell you that MRA President uh, Allison Sheets uh, solicited candidates and interviewed candidates. And Andrew, Andrew Giafredi uh, emerged uh, as the clear choice as your next MRA education director. He's about to take the microphone and let me uh, just tell you a little bit about Andrew uh, before I introduce him uh, to take it over. Andrew joined the Mountain Rescue community uh, when he was 18 years of age as a college freshman. He's been with um, Mountain uh, Western Mountain Rescue Team in Colorado for the past four years and has spent the last two years with uh, Western Mountain Rescue Team as a mission coordinator and a member of their training staff. Um, you know, once he was... Uh, expressed an interest in this in this role. I had many conversations with Andrew over the last few months, and it just became really clear he's bustling with good ideas, uh, but he's also going to need more folks to assist. So I, I know that he'll be asking for help, and I trust that some of you will be uh, jumping in uh, at his call. So with that introduction uh, behind me, I want to extend my personal gratitude to everybody with the MRA for all the support you've given the education program and frankly me over my tenure. And I'm now happy and proud to turn the microphone over and for that matter, the education committee over to uh, Andrew Giafredi. Andrew, welcome aboard, bud. Well, thank you for that great introduction, Charlie. I hope you can all hear me well. Um, I'm Andrew. As you can probably see, I'm fairly young, at least younger than Charlie by the looks of it, or maybe <laughs> I just moisturize more. It's perfect. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm super excited to be taking over and, you know, 
Charlie has some big shoes to fill, but I think the game plan is to find a different pair of shoes completely with some new ideas and uh, see where it takes us with the education committee. And uh, I appreciate you all being here for my first real uh, test to see how I do. Um, as Charlie mentioned, this is this third Thursday is kind of a uh, big part of the education committee. Um, and so we kind of need some help with it. Uh, started by Michael St. John. Uh, you know, he had a great th thing rolling and um, now it's been handed off to uh, Carrie and, and Charlie and myself now. Um, but we need some we need some more help with it. Someone to take over as possibly a third Thursday coordinator. So if any of you out there in Zoom land or uh, any of your teammates that you know of would like to help out on the education committee as a third Thursday coordinator, um, coordinating speakers and uh, promotional uh, things for that, reach out to me. Uh, you can find my email on the third Thursday poster that was sent out by Allison Sheets. Um, you can also uh, find my email by reaching out to Charlie or, or anyone else um, who might have it. I don't know where all it's posted yet uh, during this busy transition. But with that, um, I want to hand it off to not Michael St. John, as was advertised. And so if you're a big Mike fan, uh, I apologize. You have to settle for Matt Jacobs, but he should be just as good, if not better. Um, I'm super excited for this presentation. Uh, just a little of background for those of you who don't know uh, Matt. Matt has uh, 15 years of experience and SAR across several teams, including the Bay Area Mountain Rescue Team, Tahoe Nordic Search and Rescue, and Nevada County Sheriff Search and Rescue. During his time in SAR, he's helped manage some of the largest and most complex searches in California history, including as plan section chief during the initial days of the Camp Fire recovery efforts in late 2018, where operations involved over 500 searchers per day. He's a software engineer by trade. He began working on a side project to address the shortcomings of existing mapping tools for the use of search and rescue. Uh, that side project, as many of you know, eventually turned into CalTOPO and then uh, SARTOPO now specifically for our uses. Um, it's heavily used for search planning across the United States in addition to other non-SAR public safety use cases. Uh, tonight, we'll be hearing a great uh, presentation from Matt about how terrain influences lost person behavior. Uh, if you have any questions throughout Matt's presentation, please put them down into the uh, uh, message area or the, or the comments. And at the end, I'll do a Q&A with all the comments that we have. Uh, and Matt will do his best to answer them. Uh, so Matt, take it away. Thank you. Uh, I know you all came for Mike and you got me instead. Unfortunately, Mike is in the middle of assisting Monterey County with a really large search in a very remote part of the county. And he called me earlier today on his Starlink and uh, asked me for a big favor. And I, fortunately that favor was not trying to give his presentation. I've seen him give it about a dozen times when I'm sure I would not do it justice. He asked me to step in with a different presentation and both of these presentations we've kind of taught while doing search management classes together and so he asked me to step in with this one instead and hopefully you enjoy it and i'm sure mike will circle back and do his presentation at some point and when he does i would certainly encourage you to uh, to come back and check it out so i'm going to talk about train driven search management and really this came out of some research i did around 2015 uh, based on a number of searches that i've been with and it's not noted in the slideshow, but I do want to note that the MRA was nice enough to give me a little bit of funding to pursue this. None of that went to myself or paying me, but it had been my goal when I did the analysis to try to put the data out publicly and allow other people to tinker with it. And the MRA provided a small grant that let me do that and sort of fund the computing resources to do that. 
And there was a little bit of enthusiasm, but unfortunately it turns out that tinkering with the data is a lot harder than it might sound at first glance. And I didn't really get a lot of uptake on it, but I am appreciative of the MRA for doing that. And the paper is still hosted, that came out of this research is still hosted on the MRA website. So I'm gonna talk about terrain. Uh, so just before I get into the science, uh, there are a number of searches that I was involved in and some of these on the screen I was not involved in that were not in California and a lot of them that were in California I was involved with personally and kind of a common theme across them that I was noticing uh, what felt like repeatedly was people that it felt like we either didn't find or didn't find soon enough and some of them were found by people who are not formal SAR resources such as members of the public or family members and once they were found and you look back at that obviously with the benefit of 2020 hindsight they were found in a location that felt, uh, at least for the ones I was involved with, it felt kind of obvious. You're like, wow, how did you know? How did we not find them there sooner? And so that kind of got me thinking. And I started out just looking at what are the current standards that we're using, and what's the standard of care for running a search. And the numbers uh, listed on the screen come out of the NASAR Managing the Lost Person Incident book. I think these numbers are from the previous iteration of the book since I wrote it a while ago. But the standard of care as it was taught at the time and still as it's largely taught now uh, was kind of built around these three principles. And one was the establishment of a formal search area. So there's a lot of emphasis in the book on using IPP fine distance models, IPP being the initial planning point or the, the point where the, the initial point where the person was last seen and using uh, statistics in particular to try to figure out based on somebody's behavior category how far are they likely to go? And are we drawing a five mile circle around the search area or a 10 mile cir circle around the search area? But there's a lot of focus on drawing this box and only looking within that box and defining like, here's the area we're gonna look and we're not gonna look beyond there right now. There was also kind of an emphasis on management by, I should really say management by area segment. The book would say that you should search linear features, you know, roads, trails, power lines, streams, what have you but it only devoted one page to it. And there was kind of this assumption that that linear feature searching would be doable in the first day. And you go out and you do that in your hasty search and it's done. And then you switch over to formal search planning. And that formal search planning was kind of in, 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 inextricably intertwined with area segments and putting area segments on the map and managing the search via prioritizing those area segments. And then finally, uh, there was a lot of effort devoted in that standard of care to kind of determining initial probability numbers, look, figuring out how carefully you look and shifting those probability numbers over time. And that was not just driving where to look next, but it was also trying to drive uh, your probability of success or how likely you were to, have to, find, to find the person. With the goal being that at the end of the day, when you were done searching, you would say, we're gonna suspend the search because we do not think that the person is, is in the search area. And pretty much every search I've been involved with that we've had to unfortunately suspend we have thought the person is out there. The message has been, we're really sorry. We've looked really hard. We've put a lot of effort into this, but we simply cannot keep you know, showing up with 100, 200 people for the day after day continually because we felt like we've searched everywhere that we can reasonably search and reasonably expect the person to be, but we think that they are still out there. So those, that, those three principles were kind of how I would define the standard of care at the time. And again, as it's now kind of often written and taught. And if you look at where that came from, a lot of it came from the maritime and aeronautical search community. And if you look at some of the differences between those search problems and the search problems we face on land, one of the first ones is that they have very smooth distributions for both the probability of area or how likely the person is to be in a given place, and also the probability of detection or how easy it is to see them. So the graph on the top right here is a projected probability model for an airplane crash. And you can see that, you know, it's denser in the center and lighter on the outside, but small changes in distance within this graph are going to yield small changes in probability. And if you compare that to a missing person in the woods where the likelihood of them being on the trail compared to the likelihood of them being 100 feet off the trail is significantly dis different. So when you look in the wildland environment, small changes in difference, distance can yield really large changes in probability. There's also so much greater similar detectability on the ocean. It may be that if you move large distances, you hit different weather conditions, but across short distances, there's no reason that the visibility, the waves, anything like that changes significantly as compared to land where sometimes we can move very small different distances and you run into massive changes in your visibility. You move from an open field into a dense forest and then even worse, you know, some kind of dense thicket of 
blackberries and similar vegetation. When you look at the maritime and aeronautical communities and especially maritime, there's also uh, better understood search conditions. And the Coast Guard and Navy, for example, have done a lot of research where they go through a lot of objects in the water. You don't wanna put just one and see how likely you are to find it. They put a lot of objects in the water, fly over it at different elevations and speeds and see how many of those objects they locate. And that gives them a sense that if we have five foot seas and this kind of visibility, we can go fly a plane 500 feet off the deck at this speed. And here's the here's you know the likelihood of finding the person. And we don't have that research on land, but and I know there have been some efforts to try to do that research and get those numbers. But I think one of the big differences is that we also don't have consistency in our environment on land. So if you have five foot swells on the ocean and a certain level of visibility you can take uh, what you see in one place that has those conditions and apply them in a different location. There's no real common definition of like, coniferous pine forest in the, in the Western United States, where I can take one section of forest and map that to a different section of forest 20 miles away and expect that the undergrowth or similar is going to have you know, similar levels of visibility. So I think it would be really hard to build that data up on land just because the, the vegetation on land is highly variable and not easily describable. And then I would finally note this image on the bottom is of a miss, missing sailboat off the coast of Hawaii. And I'm pretty sure these are search tracks or search patterns rather than actual GPS tracks. You can see uh, here's the direction finding from a station to the initial distress call that it was somewhere along this direction. But if you look at the density of those tracks and the level of overlapping tracks from different resources, that's just not what our typical land search effort looks like. We're not able to go back and hammer the same location three or four or five times with different overlapping search efforts. Maybe if it were an evidence search where you're looking for a knife or a shell casing and you make a pass and you don't see it and you're willing to make another pass, maybe we'd be more in that sort of environment. But at the end of the day, you know, our search patterns and track maps just do not look like that. So I decided to go off and do some do some research and try to figure out how we could better approach the search problem on land. And I went off to Robert Kester, who maintains the Israel database that powers the Lost Person Behavior Book, to ask about uh, data points. And kind of surprising to me, and this was granted 10 years ago, so I think the situation has changed somewhat since then, but at least at the time, even though Kester had a lot of data, there was very little of it that had GPS locations. Normally, if he says he has a thousand cases uh, in terms of how far hikers went, most of those cases, he did not get the start and end location and then compute the distance himself. He had an agency simply report, you know, we had a 41 year old male hiker that went five miles and met some other conditions. So when I narrowed it down to data points that actually had find locations, there were only a handful of states at the time that he had uh, data sets with find locations for. And then I kind of further narrowed that down to his hiker, hunter, and gatherer groups, which was an attempt to be a proxy for able-minded, able-bodied adults. So I wasn't looking at dementia subjects. I wasn't looking at people in vehicles or crashed aircraft. Wasn't looking for little children. If you see the maps here, these are kind of the distribution of the data points that I managed to get across uh, Oregon, Arizona, New York. You can see that's kind of heavily weighted for uh, Western uh, Oregon. And I wound up splitting them up into injured or deceased. And I didn't have enough data points to split out deceased and injured separately and maintain some kind of statistical significance. And then alive and well. Um, the reason I chose to group injured and deceased together was that they felt like there would be more similarities there. Uh, somebody who's injured is less likely to be mobile. And obviously it's more likely if we don't find them in time that that injury might uh, prove to be fatal. However, I think it's important to note that injured as a category is self-reported by the agencies that report this data to Kester. So somebody who gets reported as injured might just have a sprained ankle, whereas a different agency might report that person with a sprained ankle is alive and well. Or somebody who's injured might have a broken femur. And obviously those are two very different classes of injury, but there was no good way to separate them out. So I... Uh, what I initially wanted to do was do some travel analysis from the point the person was last seen to the point they wound up. And there were not enough data points that had that point they were last seen and the point they were located. So what I wound up pivoting to was looking at the find location kind of in isolation without regard to where the person started from. And you, I've seen a lot of uh, research that has said that, you know, X percent of finds are match some criteria, you know, near a linear feature along a road, uh, what have you. But just knowing the percent of finds in isolation doesn't really tell you anything. 
For example, if you knew across your entire county that 30% of the people you're looking for are found in a forest, my first question would be, what percentage of your county is a forest? If 30% of your county is a forest and you find 30% of the people you're looking for in a forest, that doesn't really tell you anything because that's the same percentage you would get if you stood at, put a map of your county up on one wall, stood on the opposite side of the room and started throwing darts at it randomly. 30% of those darts would land in forested terrain. So instead, what I wanted to do was take find locations and compare them to the surrounding terrain so that I could get a better sense, not just of what percentage of people are found near a feature, but how meaningful that actually is. So this diagram is kind of a, a pictorial illustration of what I did. You can see a stream here with a number of forks. And if I were trying to analyze how likely are people to be found near a stream, what I would do is take this black location as representative of a find location. And I drew a big circle around that using, I think, like the median hiker distance out of the Lost Person Behavior book. And then I put a bunch of virtual sample points within that circle. And used, it was using a computer, so I used more points than what's shown here. And I would check every point and measure how far it was from the nearest stream. So if I'm uh, looking at how many people are likely to be, say, within 100 feet of a stream, this is a fine location that's within 100 feet of a stream. And then all of these blue dots, including this one here that you can see on LIDAR has a little bit of a, a drainage next to it, but it's not colored blue for some reason, are the points that are near a stream. And then what I did is I would add up across all the fine locations, what percentage of them are near a blue line. And then across all of these sample points representing all the fine locations, what percentage of them are near a blue line. So even if I only have 10% of my fine locations that are near a blue line, that might not sound like much, but if only 1% of the search terrain that I sampled is near that blue line, that actually tells me a lot because it means that even though it's not the majority of my find locations, those blue lines are 10x multiplier over what I would expect just from random chance or throwing darts at a map from across the room. So before I get to uh, feature probabilities, just some, some uh, quick nomenclature. A canyon bottom is kind of the big flat area at the bottom of a canyon. This is not a uh, it's kind of V-shaped in this case, but it's flat in the sense that there's not a lot of uh, elevation change per mile along the river. A stream trail interface was any time a stream was next to a trail. And in this case, we have a trail that is crossing the stream or the canyon bottom right there. But if instead the trail ran all the way along the base of the canyon before coming back uphill, that entire section there where it ran along the base of the canyon would be considered a stream trail interface. Um, so anytime the stream, a uh, blue line and a trail are in close proximity to each other. A stream is a blue line on the map, uh, more or less largely, whether it's uh, solid blue or dotted blue. I used, uh, instead of looking at solid or dotted, I used a different analysis that basically looked at how many forks there were up, uphill of the stream. So really faint streams didn't get counted and the more major ones did. A drainage is any kind of uh, concavity within the terrain. So you can see here that we have two drainages. One of them has this blue line in it and might also be considered a stream in addition to a drainage, whereas this one does not have a blue line. It's still a concavity in the terrain. It's still a drainage, you know, even without the presence of water. So going back to that previous slide I showed that showed this, the fine location with the number of sample points around it, and then taking the percentage of fine locations that match a certain criteria and dividing it by the percentage of uh, sample points that match that same criteria, I get a multiplier. And these uh, numbers kind of are roughly representative of different terrain features I looked at. And I broke it out into uninjured and then injured, and this should really say injured and deceased uh, because it was both of those categories combined together. And you can see that the largest uh, multiplier factor was stream trail interfaces across both of these people. Injured people were more likely to be, a, be there than uninjured, but it was still a, a really high number in both categories. And I don't have any explanation as to the why. So you could posit that somebody is walking down a trail and they get to a stream and they stop to filter water and they slip and hurt themselves, or that they get injured and they limp their way down the trail until they get water and then they stop at that water feature and wait for help. And I don't know which of those two it is. All I know is that the, the likelihood is there. Uh, next up were trails and roads below that were a pretty low multiplier. And I think the reason for that is that a lot of the find locations I had were kind of near urban areas. So when I draw that big location around the find location, part of that circle is going to include a neighborhood with a lot of roads. And I haven't, didn't, couldn't do anything programmatically to rule those out. So it would make it look like, hey, your search area has a ton of roads in it. Even though if you were planning the search, you'd probably deductively rule out the neighborhood and focus on the park or the forest next to the neighborhood. 
And so I think that kind of pushed the multiplier number for roads down, but I wouldn't use this low number as a reason not to prioritize uh, fire roads or other roads that are in the in the forest or your search area as being likely. I think that's just an artificiality of the data points I looked at in the analysis that I used. Um, Canyon bottoms also had a high multiplier, especially for injured people. Uh, streams, drainages, you know, as we move down the list, lakes, a little bit of a multiplier for high point and a little bit for ridges, but only for uninjured people. I've had people ask me, you know, it's really tempting if you're into math to take these multiplier numbers, take statistical distances that people travel, plug them into a formula and multiply them together and, you know, come out with some answer on the other end. And you can't really do that because there are a number of factors that drive these numbers up and down. And to get these numbers, I just had to kind of choose uh, select factors, such as how close do you have to be to a stream to have it count as being next to a stream. The smaller the distance you pick, the higher these numbers go, but the fewer cases are included. And so I just had to pick some representative samples to build these numbers. And what matters is the proportionality between them and not that this is a 12X number that you could take and plug into a formula. So I said that there are some factors that drive these numbers up and down, and I'm gonna walk through them. Uh, the first factor that can drive it up and down is what's called vertical relief, or basically how much terrain there is in your search area. And this is a picture of Covalo in Northern California, near where we had a, a handful of searches that kind of started me on this research. And in the valley here, that's pretty flat, it's still totally worth searching the roads, uh, streams, irrigation canals. I don't think there are many trails in there before you start doing general area searching. But it's, they're not going to be as helpful as they are out here where there's a lot of vertical relief and a lot of terrain. Out here, the benefit you're going to get from searching, you know, the canyon bottom here and the drainage there is going to be much higher than the benefit you're going to get from searching a stream in the flat terrain. So the bigger the terrain, the more useful the terrain is in helping you locate the missing person. Numbers also went up with something that's called uh, IPP find distance, or basically the distance from the initial point where you thought they last were to where they wind up. So here's an example of a missing hunter that we had that was a, a real search. And within like the first you know, mile and a half or so, you should certainly search the trails, the blue lines, the drainages that don't have a blue line along them before you just do general area searching. But sort of the bang for your buck you're gonna get from searching those linear features versus doing area searching is not going to be as high as it is out here. And the further out you push from where the person was last seen, that's where be terrain becomes more useful and starts being much more likely that the person is going to be in this drainage or along this canyon bottom it is that they're just going to be walking along, you know, out in the middle of this slope here. So the numbers also went up uh, with feature prominence, which is, you know, fancy word for how big something is. So, you know, the, you would want to search the, uh, the big, the bigger drainage here before you search like the smaller side slope drainage there. And you'd want to search the big ridge line up at the top before you search the little side slope ridge line there. The numbers went down with track offset, which is the term for how far away from uh, the feature you're looking at you want to search. And I think that's no surprise to somebody that people are more likely to be on a trail than they are to be off the trail, but kind of close to it. So the thing that was kind of surprising to me was that the, the maximum distance that you really want to look for most of these linear features is only about 100 feet. I've seen searches where we kind of search the, the road, trail, what have you first, and if we don't find the person, then it's like, okay, let's search within a quarter mile of the trail system. Then we'll come back and search within a half mile of the trail system. And it kind of seems intuitively correct that if you're looking for somebody who started out on a trail, they're more likely to be kind of close to a trail than they are to be really far away from a trail. But what I found was that that wasn't really correct. And you can see on the map here, I've kind of highlighted, I don't have a key, but I think the blue line is 100 feet and the red line is 200 feet. 100 feet is not really that far off the feature. And, you know, this is kind of a rough rule of thumb. But once somebody goes, you know, more than a little bit off of the linear feature, they're just as likely to be anywhere in the search area. Being, you know, a quarter mile or a half mile from a linear feature doesn't really do anything to, to make the area you're looking at more probable. So there's nothing about being kind of close, but not super close to, the fe to a feature that actually drives the, the probability of, a, of something up. When I did my initial research, I had a maximum number that was more like 100 meters than 100 feet. And I think there are a couple of factors that fed into that. Um, one is that 
roads, trails, streams, and so on are not, map not mapped perfectly. And you can see this now on CalTOPO, now that we have LIDAR data for lots of parts of the country, there are some places you'll see that suddenly the blue line on the map looks comically incorrect relative to the relief shading in the LIDAR, uh, just because it wasn't mapped properly. There's also, I think, a lot of the data points, even though we have a lot long for the find location, when a team finds the missing person, their first priority is not to stand right over that missing person and say, excuse me, sir, hold on, I know you have an injured leg, but let me get an accurate GPS location of like where you're standing right here. And if they have a GPS location, it might be taken while they're standing kind of near the subject, maybe standing back a little to work the radio while somebody else talks to the missing person. Or it might've been done after the fact by somebody looking at a map and eyeballing a location. There's gonna be some error in where the, uh, the locations I have for where people were found. And there's gonna be a little bit of error in the data I have for where the features actually are. And both of those two pieces of error are going to combine to make people look like they were a little further away from the feature than they actually were. So a number of the data points that I got from Kester had written descriptions that came with them. And when I went back through and I read all the written descriptions and anytime it said subject was found, you know, 40 feet away from the trail, subject slid 30 feet downhill, what have you. I used those numbers and kind of took those verbatim. And when I used those numbers, I got a num maximum offset that was closer to 100 feet rather than 100 meters. There's also kind of a probability curve where you, your probability is highest on the feature and then it gradually drops down as you move away and you don't have to search the linear feature to the very edges where that probability curve flattens out to zero. So for all those reasons, it's a very rough rule of thumb that could very well make sense that it's a little closer and it could very well make sense that it's a little wider, but I tell people about plus or minus 100 feet. So 100 feet to the left of the feature and 100 feet to the right of the feature. If you are on a canyon bottom or searching a river and there's a whole lot of dense vegetation near it, but you know, open, easy travel routes further away, maybe it makes sense to push it out closer to like the 100 meter number that I had from looking at the data points. But if you're looking at the, do I need to call, crawl through that vegetation because it's right next to the feature, that's really like the, the 100 foot corridor that I plus or minus 100 feet. So I took this research that I did and those probability multiplier numbers and kind of started shopping around to people and being like, hey, we should start thinking about doing things a little differently than the way that we're doing them. And, I, and one of the pieces of pushback I got at the time was the like, congratulations, you just rediscovered hasty searching. Like, look right here in the textbook. We'll show you the page where it says that you should hasty search all of these linear features that your terrain point, that your uh, research pointed at. So like, this is nothing new. And my response to that would be that our search areas have a lot of terrain. And as just one example, I would say that across all the data points that I looked at, there were as many miles of stream as there were of trail. And if you were to look at your typical team doing your typical missing person search, they would definitely search 20 plus miles of trail before they switched from their hasty mode into their you know, more formal area search mode. Almost none of them would be searching 20 miles blue line. You'd be lucky if they would search maybe two or three miles of blue line before switching over. Of the search area I looked at, you know, 5% was within 30 feet of a road trail or stream, and 20% was within 100 feet of some kind of micro terrain feature. And I'm just going to say flat out, like it does not logistically make sense to go search every little micro terrain feature and then come back and do area searching filled in in between those little micro terrain features. At some point, it makes sense to just go area search. So I'm not saying that 20% of your search area is something you should call out separately with linear search segments and having people go, you know, go and hit those as linear feature assignments. But what I do want to impress on you is that there's a lot of terrain in the areas we search. And then a lot of these people that are near terrain are not immediately findable. And this guy was a, a hunter who I was involved with the search for who was last seen here. And his find location is approximate. It might've been down in the canyon bottom where my cursor is here. And the reason it's approximate is that his family found him via a private helicopter after the search was suspended. And the point I would make is that anywhere he along this canyon bottom is possibly not a day one assignment. Depending on the information you have, it might not even be a day two assignment unless you have aviation. Like these days, we would have aviation go and fly that canyon bottom right away as one of our first assignments. But many of these people that are located along terrain are not in a location that you're realistically going to be able to search in the hasty operational period. You might not even get to them on day two. And I think more importantly, they're not necessarily in locations that you would want to go search before you do some kind of area searching in closer. If you think somebody is likely to have had a medical event near their last known point, it may make sense to be doing area searching in close before you kind of get to searching this terrain that's further out. So I don't think this is really just a question of 
congrats, this is hasty searching. Like the book says this, we should be doing all of this before you know we start our formal search planning, just because of the volume of terrain that's in the search area and the amount of time it would take us to actually search all of that terrain. Uh, another a question or that I frequently had is, you know, whether this was just going up or going down. You know, people that are found in a canyon bottom, are they found in the canyon bottom simply because when they get lost, they decide to walk downhill and they get funneled into a canyon bottom. And a lot of people may well choose to walk downhill and get funneled into terrain. But the thing I would want to impress upon you is the terrain is useful even when you're a long distance and a complicated travel route away from where the person went missing. Some of these people may go uphill and then downhill and uphill again. They may hop from one feature to another. And it's not as simple as you should look downhill and only look in the canyon bottom that's directly downhill from where they were last seen. And uh, we have this uh, person who went missing in Placer County a number of years ago as a sort of case study that I use. It was uh, spring and there was a lot of snow on the ground. So he parked his car here, uh, came up, went camping here overnight. Because of the snow on the ground, he got disoriented and came down to the south thinking he was returning to the north. There's a fire road here that is not accurately mapped and shown on the map that he hooked up with. And when he hit this uh, creek coming through this canyon, he thought it was the Yuba River. And if he followed it upstream, he would get back to his car. And ultimately he was found by, a, by an air helicopter at the up in this canyon. I think it's a, an interesting illustration for two reasons. And one is that the location he was found was in the bottom of a canyon, but it was not really directly downhill from where he was last seen. And even to the extent that you could maybe have gone directly downhill and wound up there, that is not the path he took. And the other is that he moved from a road and went off the road and onto the canyon. And I kind of started this research just inherently assuming that people would start on smaller features and get funneled to big ones. You know, people would get funneled from a drainage to a stream, from a stream to a trail, from a trail to a road that nobody would leave a road and go follow a stream. And clearly that's not the case. And so this image I had had in my head when I started the research that people are going to start on the smaller locations and get funneled into the bigger ones, I don't think was actually sort of borne out in reality. So knowing that that is a uh, terrain, how do we put it to use? And I'm just gonna preface this by saying I have a slide at the end that kind of is a teaser for a whole nother presentation I have about search planning and kind of how we put this to use in search planning. So this is more of a big picture, how to think about terrain and less of a formal process about here's how you apply terrain inside of a formal search planning process. But the first thing I would say is to think about a spider web instead of a bike wheel. The traditional search management textbooks and teachings all talk about treating the search area as a bike wheel. All of that uh, statistical distance to figure out how far out you should search forms the rim of the bike wheel where you've got your boundary and you're not looking beyond the boundary of that bike wheel. And then inside of the bike wheel, you have your linear features are the spokes that kind of connect the hub, which is where the person was last seen, to the rim. And I would instead encourage you to think about a spider web instead. And there's a couple of reasons for that. And one is that a spider web doesn't really have a well-defined rim. If you think about a spider web that's being held up, it's kind of you know held up in some location, but there's often a handful of stringers that go up to the ceiling, out to a wall, out to another wall that are holding that spider web in place. And those are your roads, trails, and canyon bottoms that will totally make sense to search to really long distances, even if most of your search effort is kind of focused more closer in where the center of the spider web is. The other reason that I would say think of a spider web instead of the bike wheel is that spider webs really have lots of spokes. The typical bike wheel model, as I would see it mapped on paper, would have like four or five spokes. And the reality is there's a lot of terrain in our search area. It's very interconnected. And... So I think it's difficult to think of a spider web and then draw four strands for that spider web on a piece of paper and call yourself done. So these spokes should be kind of denser at the center and sparser as you move out. And then you hit those stringers representing the soft wind that are the roads, trails, and canyons kind of holding the spider web up to great, to long distances. I also think it's important to think about using search tactics in parallel. So to get rid of this distinction between a hasty phase and an area phase, and instead realize that it's totally okay to be doing area searching Early on in the effort, if you have a strong reason to suspect that the person might be unresponsive, proximate to a certain location, and it's also totally okay to be doing hasty style searching on day four or day five in locations that you haven't searched yet, you know, pushing further out into the search area. So to like get rid of the sequential thinking about the hasty phase and then the area phase, and instead think about using kind of a mix of tactics throughout the search effort. So when you start planning, I think it's important to think about the factors that are driving your probability of area or driving where you think the person is. 
And I'm gonna say that there are, I think there are roughly like four factors that, that drive you know where we think the person is. One is local knowledge. You know, is there a strong case history from this area? Locally, when we have a missing skier out of bounds at a ski resort, they often wind up in the same locations. And that's because skiers really do not like going uphill, especially when it's soft. And you'll get on their track and you'll follow them. And sometimes you'll see them stop and start booting uphill. And you're like, this is the person who's the exception of the rule. And then 100 feet later, you can tell they go, wow, this is tough work. They put their skis back on, keep going downhill. So that local knowledge lets us know, like, these are this is kind of the exact location that we should start heading towards because this is where the train is has funneled the last 50 people who have all wound up in a, in a similar location. Another factor to look at is distance. Uh, and generally when people say distance, they're referring to statistical distances from the lost person behavior book was kind of the primary distance they're looking at. And I'm gonna say, I think there's a lot of good information in uh, Kester's lost person behavior book, but I think distance is probably the most over applied piece of information I see. When people take a distance from the book, draw it as a range ring on the map, and then use that range ring to really drive and focus their search effort. And when I'm looking to apply distance and really lean in on distance as a factor, there are kind of two things that I'm looking for. And one is how close is my initial planning point to the initial event or mechanism of disappearance? You know, we're out looking for somebody because something happened to them. Maybe it was just a miscommunication between them and a loved one, and they're actually fine and on track, and they're simply delayed or they, there was a miscommunication over their exit time. Maybe they injured themselves. Maybe they got lost. Maybe they had a medical event. Maybe they succumbed to an environmental injury, what have you. But there was, we're out looking for them because something happened. And so one thing I'm trying to look at is how close is my initial planning point? So that's something that happened. As an example, if we locally have a Pacific Crest Trail through hiker who was last seen leaving Highway 50 and never made it to Highway 80, I don't really have any strong reason to suspect that the, whatever bad thing happened to them happened to them right when they left Highway 50 at their last known point. As far as I'm concerned, whatever it was that happened to them was kind of equally likely to have happened between the point they left and their destination. In contrast, if you have a four or five year old child who's camping with their family, parents are cooking dinner, they turn around and the, the child is gone. You know, it could be an abduction, it could be the child wandered off, it could be something else. But whatever it is probably happened right there because the child was not out of their parents' sight for very long. So that missing child is a, you have a very predictive initial planning point uh, where you know that whatever happened to them happened to them right, right near where they were last seen. So in addition to having that pre distance predictive initial planning point where I know that the initial event kind of happened close to where they were last seen, I'm also trying to look at do they fit a behavioral model? So going back to that campground, you know, four or five-year-old, I'm absolutely wanting to know how far does a typical four-year-old go? Do they know that they're lost? Are they likely to call back the rescuers? All that sort of information. Because I don't, I don't know how far a typical four-year-old is able to go. If I go back to the Pacific Crest Trail through hiker, if I can go look and know that their last resupply point was five days ago, and I can look at the distance between their last resupply point and the point they were last seen and divide it by you know, five days and know they were covering 15 miles a day, Already, that gives me far more information about them than knowing what hikers or backpackers do on average across the Western United States. So, you know, those are the two factors that I'm really looking in, looking at. If on a search, I'm going to lean in on uh, statistical distance as one of the big factors I'm using to drive probability of area. Separately from distance, there are a lot of other behavioral factors that, and an example I would use is an elderly dementia subject that has a low, what Kester calls dispersion angle. So they walk out their front door and they're likely to keep walking in that direction and they're less likely to make a U-turn and go the other way. So the distance, they, the direction they were headed when they were last seen or when they left their house is kind of predictive of where they're likely to wind up. That's a super key, super useful piece of information that is not reflected in statistical distance. And then finally terrain. Um, you know, What's the vertical relief in the search area? Does it have terrain? And I'm not saying that any search is going to only look at one of these factors, but I think a lot, some searches you're going to lean very heavily into one or two of these factors and other searches you're going to lean very heavily into a different factor. So as you look at these uh, factors and think about where the person is going to be, I think it's really important to develop a big picture plan. Uh, traditionally, and the way search management is taught, once you've built your bike wheel and you've got your search area, you build a bunch of segments within there, and then you assign probability across those segments. But before you get to that segment level plan, I think it's really important to stop and hit pause and come up with a big picture plan first. You know, discuss both scenarios, what you think was the likely mechanism of disappearance or the likely initial event, 
and also discuss at a high level where's the person likely to be. And this is not segment A versus segment B. This is, do we think they led to the west off the summit or do they think that we went, they went to the east? You know, are they in the left side of the map or are they on the right side of the map? And you're gonna use that information to drive your resource allocation. If you have a location on the map or a scenario that's really likely, obviously that has to get more resources and you have to hit it in depth. But it's really important to kind of explore those regions and options in parallel. So it's not that you go focus all your efforts on the highest priority area, and then you search that, and then you go search the second high highest priority area. Instead, you wanna ask, you know, if I put 80% of my search effort in this bucket and I put 10% of my search effort in another bucket, I only have 10% spread everywhere else. You know, if I can only get one team out somewhere, what's kind of my quick wins that I can get out of that team? And as an example of that, uh, this is a search that was in Teton County. I had zero involvement with it and I don't know any details other than what was public. The reason I like including it is because this map wound up on the internet and I think it's very illustrative of the point that I'm trying to make. We have a uh, hunter uh, who was uh, well known in the community. It sounds like there was a very large effort involving community volunteers as well, looking for him over a number of days. He was last seen, hopefully you can see my cursor here, kind of to the right of where it says C. And they had some clues that, uh, or a major clue that led them astray with an animal that had been shot and not fully harvested. And who does that? So there's the potential that you know he did that, and then a, a you know a mountain lion or other predatory animal comes along, and and something happens. You can't really see it from the map, but there's a ridge line here, and the trail kind of goes up and over the ridge line. And I, I think you know this is this is good textbook uh, segmentation for how you know the textbook would describe segmenting a search search effort search area. If you were to bring me in and say, hey, you know, we built this map, let's do a probability consensus, tell us what you think our most likely segments are. I would absolutely agree with the segments that have the most tracks in them. It's going to be the C, D, E, T, but where the person was last seen, A and B, where they have this clue pushing them that way. There's no way I would take any of these segments elsewhere on the map and rank them any near as probable as the, uh, as the segments near where he was missing. But if you were to instead say, hey, we think there's like maybe a 10% chance he's over on like this whole southwestern corner of the map, we can only spare one team to go poke around for a day, what should we do? The answer would be, you can't really see the terrain because it's covered by the segment lines, but there's a canyon bottom here that he was ultimately found in. And the answer would be, go search the canyon bottom. And then secondarily, if there's time, search some of the drainages uh, leading downhill from the ridge line. And the reason I like including this is not in any way to knock on the search, but because I think it's a great illustration of the fact that once you've segmented the search area, that segmentation drives the way you think about the search problem. There's no way now that I've segmented this to kind of mentally think about like, I'm gonna put a little bit of priority right here in this kind of quick win location. And th this is why I think it's so important to sort of start with that big picture plan, think about how much effort you can afford to put over in this entire side of the map, and then think about how to approach it based on the amount of effort you have. So Landsar is a multi-dimensional problem. There's a lot of both in terms of where we look and then how we look. You know, are we going to move really fast and cover lots of terrain and cover lots of ground, but not really do as good a job searching for the person, hope they're in an, on an obvious location, hope they're able to call back and make voice calls? Or are we going to move really, really slow and be careful and look under every nook and cranny and be really thorough about our search effort? And you can apply that both to linear features or to area. So what I have here is kind of a graph that just would show, you know, hypothetically, the x-axis is effort or, you know, how much work you put into the search effort and the y-axis is the result or the likelihood of finding the person. And basically, early on in the search, when you haven't put much effort in, each hour of effort you put in has a, moves the needle a lot and, and the, the slope of the curve is steeper, has a higher likelihood of boosting the results. A lot of searches are, you know, somebody gets reported missing, family member panics because they aren't home yet. You send a deputy to go park at the trailhead for two hours, person pops out, doesn't get easier to resolve than that. You know, the next level is when you start hasty searching, you have maybe a handful of teams moving down the trail and you bump into somebody who was delayed. Again, not, you know, a lot of bang for your buck per hour you put in. By the time you get to the point where you have searchers separated 60 feet apart, moving back and forth across areas in a grid pattern, the likelihood of finding them relative to every hour of effort you put into the search is really, really low. So the curve kind of flattens. Every hour you put in doesn't really move the needle that much. So what I kind of observed that we were doing, at, at least in the California searches I was involved in, 
is that days day one or day zero, we'd be all the way over here on the left side of the curve. And then kind of the moment we hit day two and OP2 when we started really doing a good job planning for the search, we kind of jump all the way over to the right-hand side of the curve, where all of a sudden we'd switch from this fast-moving, linear you know, terrain feature, hasty style searching to we're area searching. And not only are we area searching, but we're area searching for an unresponsive person, you know, spaced out such that we're looking for that person who's not going to call back. We're doing it pretty slow and carefully. We're looking at every nook and cranny. And, you know, as a result, because we're we're at the right side of the curve and we don't have these kind of tool terrain as a tool and toolbox in the middle, we kind of have to optimize for the people who are in close because there's no way I'm going to go back to that previous map and pick one of those far out segments and area search that far out segment when I haven't done one that's closer in. So I think it's really important instead to think about slowly walking your way along this curve as the search progresses, where you start with hasty and then you move into linear terrain features and more of a higher POD unresponsive oriented search and linear terrain features before you get to course and fine area searching. And I also think it's really critical as you think about kind of inching your way along this curve to think about doing it independently in different parts of the search area. So the search effort as a whole does not move in lockstep along this curve. Instead, it's based on what else you've done in a given part of the search area. So near where the person was last seen, you may be over here on the right-hand side of the curve, while way out where you haven't looked yet, you may be on the left side of the curve because it's a place you can only spare one team to go look. And if you can only do that, you're probably gonna aim for the cover lots of ground, look for the obvious person, try to make the voice calls. So again, thinking about inching your way along the curve and thinking about doing it in each new part of the search area you haven't searched yet. And this isn't to say that you have to move in these three steps. If you have a likely despondent person and you know who's probably close to their vehicle, and that's a scenario, it may make sense to jump right into here without inching your way along the curve. But for most of the people we're looking for, you kind of want to walk your way slowly along here. So thinking about how you apply that, when you're on the very left side, left side of the curve, the less likely areas, those are generally gonna be you know, roads, trails, and canyons uh, are what you're gonna be able to search within those less likely regions of the map. And it's okay to push these features out to really long distances. You know, People that get on a trail and are gonna follow that trail until they hit civilization, or they start head, heading downhill along a river and they're gonna follow that river until they hit civilization. It's okay at this stage to rely on faster, less thorough search tactics. So you know, moving fast and doing voice calls and hoping the person is going to be calling back to you, relying on OHVs or e-bikes to move quickly but be less thorough, and also to use helicopters to go search, uh, particularly, I would say, along water sources where you're going to have a live subject who's able to wave back and as, position themselves in a way that they're going to be more easily seen by the aircraft. As a search, this is kind of a tangent, but as the search goes on, you know, subject's mobility is going to drop as they don't have enough food, you know, they're not able to take care of themselves over time, their mobility drops. As their mobility drops, if they're alive, they're more, they're more likely to be along water until they get to the point where if they're no longer, no longer mobile, kind of by definition, if they haven't been mobile for a couple of days and they're alive, they're next to water because they need water to survive. So especially as the search goes on, focusing on water sources for your techniques that are going to do best with a subject that is alive and able to shout back, signal to a helicopter, what have you. Um, when you're in these less likely areas of the map and you're applying these faster moving, quicker wind techniques, uh, two notes that I'd make. One, I think it's really important to pay attention to what I would call a black hole, which is a canyon with no easy downhill exit. An example, some of these people that were at the beginning of my slideshow, at least one of them went missing in the Mendocino National uh, Forest, which is an area that has all the roads at the top on ridgelines. All the rivers are like wild and scenic rivers. So if you decide you're going to follow the river downhill until you hit civilization, it's 20 to 30 miles of walking before you cross a road. And those are the places that's really important to get into quickly before the person sort of goes for broke along them. If they're going to follow a river and pop out at a road in a couple of miles, it becomes a lot less important to focus on that feature. The other thing I think it makes important to pay a lot of attention to, just based on the research I did, is the stream trail interfaces. So even if you're in hasty search mode and you're booking it and you're looking for that obvious subject, when you hit a, a stream crossing, maybe slow down a moment, take a breath, look up and down the stream a little bit just to make sure there isn't somebody that's you know slightly off trail along the stream, and then pick it up and go back into that low POD, fast moving search mode as you continue hasty searching down the trail. 
So as we kind of inch into the middle of the curve, uh, areas or parts of the map that are more likely, but you can't just throw enough resources at them, saturation search them. You're going to want to do higher POD, you know, more unresponsive oriented searching to a maximum of about 100 feet to either side of streams and drainages, lake shores, high points, cliff bases, and also features searched previously at a lower POD. So if in this part of the map a day or two ago, you ran e-bikes on all the roads and trails, this is your time to go back with a ground team and do a corridor search along those roads and trails looking for the unresponsive person that's not immediately on the feature. Um, this is kind of a good zone to be deploying your specialized resources that might kind of have high, more highly variable POD, uh, sign and scent cutting, uh, looking for track and for trailing dogs if you've already exhausted trying to go from the last known point, simply trying to pick trail intersections or obvious other obvious points and cut for a uh, percent and also using air scent dogs, particularly along streams and, and drainages. And that's because often because you may be able to come back with a ground team and search these again at a later point in time. And you're kind of, so it's okay to kind of lean in on these resources that may have really good days and make that miracle find that helps you pivot the search, or maybe more likely to kind of miss, miss something just because scent conditions don't happen to work out or the terrain is not very helpful to track in or what have you. And then to the extent that you can afford to put resources outside of these linear features, really focusing on voice responsive coverage. Um, ridge lines are a great place to, to do voice calls back and, and hear the person and hear a person shout back. You can't afford to saturation search the area and look for that unresponsive person, but maybe you can afford to find the person who's able to shout back and is looking to get sound. And then as you move to the right side of the curve in the most likely areas, you're looking at you know, an area search. And then as you move to the very right side of the uh, curve, you're probably looking at an additional pass with an area team, uh, whether that is a second pass with a ground team or a second pass with a se separate resource type. Going in with a dog so to hope to find the stinky thing that was in a really hard place to see or going in with ground searchers to follow up after a dog has already been through. So one point I would make as we're nearing the end is that people are survivors and much more than we give them credit for. And often there are a lot of people we go look for that, you know, they fall off a cliff and they, they die instantaneously. They're buried in an avalanche, something like that. But your person who just is lost and in the woods and starts out, you know, okay, as long as there's, they don't suffer traumatic injury. And as long as the weather is not horrible and they don't suffer an environmental injury early on, they can survive for a really long period of time. And this uh, stat is directly out of the lost person behavior book. And I think this was using like the, a combination of the hunter and hiker data, but I don't remember off the top of my head. But 40% of people who were found after four or more days, four or more days of searching or found after they were missing for four or more days are ultimately found alive. By the time I was doing this research, and I can only speak for the Northern California searches I was involved in, four days into the search, pretty much all we were doing was high POD searching and area searching. By day four, we were like, if they were out there and they were alive and able to shout back, we would have found them by now. Like they've got to, they've got to be at least un unresponsive. And you know, if they're unresponsive for a significant period of time, they're probably deceased. So there was this very big mismatch between the way we were approaching the search and the actual survivability of people that we're out looking for. So I think it's really important to just keep that stat in mind that even days into a search, 40 plus percent of the people who are found are found alive. So it's important to kind of maintain a positive sense of urgency. Don't let the search tempo sort of turn into a slow grind where all you're doing is that higher POD unresponsive searching. Use a mix of tactics throughout the search. Even if there are areas you're doing higher POD area searching which is totally legitimate. Think about where you can send teams either focused on linear features or fast moving hasty searches even further out in parts of the search area you haven't really looked at yet. So even though the search area is unlikely, when you're way on the left side of that effort curve, you can multiply a really high likelihood of success per hour you invest by a low likelihood of the person being there and still wind up with a, a value that makes it worth you know, going out and searching for them. And I'm not suggesting you actually plug numbers into a spreadsheet and do that mathematically, but just in your head uh, thinking about it. And then before you suspend a search, be really important to think about wide ranging voice responsive coverage it's really embarrassing to not find somebody out there who's alive and well and able to shout back. And also a really thorough search of all water sources. Again, going back to over time as people are missing, their mobility is going to drop. And they're going to, if they're alive, almost by definition, as their mobility drops, they're going to be increasingly you know, consistent and close to water sources. So making sure you've really checked all your water sources before you suspend a search to maximize your chance of finding a live person. 
So to recap, uh, think about a spider web rather than a bike wheel model. Prioritize your larger features over your smaller ones and your downs over your ups and search roads, trails, and canyons to large distances. And that's kind of the terrain research in a nutshell. In terms of applying it, you know, start with a big picture plan before you start drawing segments. Explore your options in parallel. Use a mix of tactics. Don't let the search move in lockstep. If, if you're doing high POD searching in one place, think about things you can do with one or two teams to go give you quick wins in other parts of the map. And that even once you're in a campaign search that's four or five days into it, there's still more, much more to a campaign search than simply doing unresponsive gridded area searching. So that's kind of the end of the training presentation I have. I have one more slide that I want to throw in. And uh, just kind of as a teaser, I said that this, this presentation is about the research that I did. And then I have some other presentations that kind of give you a little more of a formal process for how to take that and plan a search. And I'm going to give a talk at the MRA conference in uh, Salt Lake City this summer that is about that. And it's taking this presentation and like two other hours of material from this class that Mike and I have taught together and condensing it all down into 45 minutes. I'm not quite sure how I'm going to get it all condensed at, at that in, into that amount of time. But if you're interested in this, I'd encourage you to show up to that class. But I, I kind of want to take one thing out of that class and bring it into this presentation, because if you don't go on to learn anything else. I do think this is really, really important. And the two of the misses, uh, even after we found, I did this terrain-driven research, I, we, a lot of our searches started pivoting more to focusing on terrain features and terrain-driven searching, searching. But even so, we continue to kind of have some misses where it's like, we should have found that person sooner. And looking at why we had those misses, there were kind of two big things that came out. And one is thinking about a goal before for your search. And I'm going to say that there are often three basic goals and the search is not going to have a single goal. It's going to be somewhere on a spectrum. But on one end, you have a life-saving intervention. As an example, um, a, not all autistic children are attracted to water, but a substantially high percentage of, uh, I forget the source that we looked it up. It did not come from the lost person behavior book, but it was 84% of autistic children who are found deceased are found deceased in the water. So if you have a child who has autism, who's missing near a water source, camping a search and rescue volunteer out at that water source to act as a containment is not the fastest way to find that child, but it may be the most effective way to prevent that child from accidentally harming themselves until you find them. Moving on from that life-saving intervention, you have the difference between a live find and maximizing the chance of a find. So if you're searching for somebody on you know day two in the middle of a storm, it may the searches you do looking for them where they are alive and able to shout back is maybe at different locations on the map that you look, but also different strategies that you look relying on moving faster and voice calls. And it may be totally justifiable, even though much of the way search planning is taught is about maximizing the chance of finding the person to say at this phase in the search, we're focused much more heavily on maximizing the chance of a live find before they succumb to environmental injuries. And we can always come back two days later, next week, two months later as the snow melts, what have you, and go try to find the person if they were deceased. But we're going to focus right now on finding them before they kind of make that transition from life to dead. And then finally, max, just maximizing the chance of a find without regard to outcome. But I'm going to say that all of these you know, are very different search strategies and very different locations to look. If you have one day before a big storm comes in, even if you think the person's at the base of a cliff, it may not make sense to look there because nothing you're going to do finding them at the base of a cliff is going to change the outcome in terms of whether or not you ultimately find them alive. So as you're developing that big picture plan, one thing to keep in mind is what is your goal? You know, how, What are you trying to accomplish? Because that's going to drive a very different uh, way of searching. And another thing to keep in mind in your head that has also been a frequent miss for us is what are your strategies? And we'll go through and we'll vote on scenarios. And these are simple one word, lost, medical, trauma, drowned, what have you. And we'll vote on probabilities for them and say that you know we have 80% of our votes going towards lost and 20% towards trauma, hypothetically. And the reason we do that is that these scenarios mean very different search strategies. Somebody who's lost is generally going to make voice contact with you. They're gonna, if they hear you, they're going to shout for help. If they hear you shouting, they're going to respond back. So you're really focused on moving fast, going to great distances, relying on voice contact. Um, somebody who suffered a traumatic injury, you know, people can trip and hurt themselves anywhere. But in terms of a truly incapacitating injury, almost nobody trips over a route on a trail and winds up to the point where they are potentially you know, unable to hike out 
severely, severe, severe injury. Typically, the people who suffer traumatic injuries do so in really hazardous locations, you know, a boulder field where there's all these little gaps in the boulder field where they can get their leg in and accidentally twist their ankle or break their leg, or more commonly what we see, falling off a cliff or a steep part of the mountain and landing at the bottom. And with the number of misses we had where, you know, we're doing a lost style search for days and we're you know, making use of terrain, searching all the streams, searching all the drainages, pushing out for 10 miles. And at the end of the day, we find the person at the base of a cliff near their intended near their intended climbing route. And the reason for that mismatch is that we didn't pause and do enough thinking about what's the likely scenario and how are we going to adapt our search plan to that scenario. So those are just two things that I want to throw out there that really come from the different presentation I have, but I think tie tie into the how you would apply terrain as you're coming up with your big picture plan and then pursuing your search effort. And that is my presentation. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Matt. Uh, if anyone has any questions, throw them in the chat uh, and I'll read them out. We'll have about 10 minutes of Q&A if we've got the questions for it. Let's see. Someone's got a question. Either I'm a much better speaker than Mike, or I'm not nearly as inspiring as him. <laughs> Great stuff, Matt. John, that is not a question. But that was a very good presentation. Kevin asks, any suggestions for research moving forward? Yeah, so I put about a month of my life into this, and I don't know, I'm certainly not in a position that I can do that again right now. Uh, one thing that sticks out at me, I used uh, computers to determine a lot of the linear features I was looking at. The, the stream data comes from the USGS, but uh, drainages, for example, came from looking at how one piece of terrain mapped to the surrounding terrain. And for a lot of the terrain features I used, like I don't think the computer analysis was nearly as good as a person. And it wouldn't really have made sense for me to start, you know, as a person identifying all these terrain features on a map because I didn't really know what I was looking for. I had actually gone into this intending to spend more effort looking at like, are we likely to find people in places without much tree cover? Or are they more likely to be in places with tree cover? Are they more likely to be on steep slopes or flatter terrain? And I didn't actually get any, you know, results from those. But if I were to go back and do it again, what I would love to do is to, for each find location to take kind of an anonymized circle around it. You don't want the person doing this to know that the find location was in the middle of a circle, but give people you know a patch of the map and say, draw me lines representing every stream, draw me lines representing every drainage, you know, draw me lines representing the cliff bases, and then use those rather than uh, the information that was you know that I generated via computer because I think those would probably produce much more useful and interesting results. I don't think the end result the terrain is useful is going to change, but I think the the multiplier numbers I got definitely might you know shift around a little bit based on that. Another thing I would love to be able to have done is as we've kind of over time understood the importance of scenarios, like I said, you know the people who, they download a GPS track, they have a map, you know, they're not really a great candidate for getting lost. They're out in hazardous terrain, climbing a peak, you know, trauma is really creeping up high on the suspicion index in terms of what happened to them. Uh, going back and taking the data that I had from Kester and categorizing it based on scenario, you know, so looking uh, in terms of how likely people were to be near terrain features at people who met a lost scenario versus people who met a different scenario. And I think it would be really interesting to be able to tease those apart. Awesome. Thank you for the question, Kevin. Anyone else? All right, going once, going twice. Awesome, if anyone has any questions um, while we're wrapping up, um, we can try to fit them in. But 
Matt, thank you so much for uh, joining us for this um, very short notice third Thursday. Um, we appreciate you filling in for Mike and uh, make sure to give him our gratitude as well uh, for uh, helping out. Um, thanks, for, thanks for sticking with me, everyone, even though it was not the uh, presentation you came for. I think it was uh, very prevalent as we, especially as we move into the summer. I don't know about everyone else, but starting to turn into search season in my neck of the wo woods. So good stuff to think about. Um, yeah, well, just to close out the evening, uh, next month, our third Thursday is going to be a uh, critical mission debrief, I think, from Heiko Stopsack uh, up in Washington, uh, talking about a mission that they had uh, recently. So make sure to tune in for that. Um, we look forward to continuing third Thursdays. We've got uh, speakers lined up for at least the next three months. So be sure to stop by. I'll be sending out more posters and stuff. And if you thought, you know, that my poster wasn't up to par and that you could do better, please uh, let me know. And I am more than happy to let someone else take over um, as the third Thursday coordinator. Again, please just reach out uh, to your team and see if anyone is interested in, in stepping into that role. Um, you can have them reach out to me. Awesome. Matt, any other closing thoughts? Nope, but if any questions pop up down the road, feel free to shoot me an email. Awesome. Well, thank you all so much for joining. I hope you have a good rest of your night. Uh, and be safe. We hope to see you next month. Thanks, everyone. Well, Matt, I hope to see your uh, presentation at the MRA conference too. Awesome. Well, it'll be in. good to see you there. Yeah. I don't know if I'm supposed to wait around for anything. I think you're all good. I'm just waiting to see if anyone else has anything to say in closing. Uh, hey, Charlie's guys, I'm back. back.